Apostle Paul opens his letter, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Skip, can you put that up? This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. We went through that. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and the deacons. You know, uh, after the apostles died, the highest ranking office in the church of Jesus Christ were the elders or pastors or shepherds or overseers or bishops. All those words, by the way, are synonymous. We even the American church have butchered it and we've given them various levels of rankings, but they all mean the exact same thing in the New Testament. And so Paul is telling us he's writing to the leadership of the early church. And it's interesting, Paul uses for elders, he uses the Greek word episkopos, and it literally means one who guards, one who guards. So in a spiritual sense, an elder or a pastor or an overseer or a bishop, their job is to guard your soul. That's an important task. Their job is to guard your soul, to oversee your soul. So the next time you say, well, pastor, you're meddling in my life, that's the job. That's my job. My job, you're paying me the big bucks to meddle in your life. Now, please also notice, Paul talks about deacons. Deacons were also leaders in our leaders in the church. In fact, uh, we see how the deacons got started uh, in uh, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Skip, can you put that up? So we see how the, the deacons got started. But as the believers were rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their window or widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the Twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the Word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea. They chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, or Nicanor, Timon, Parmius, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These Seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Now, these seven men became known as deacons. It comes from the Greek word deaconos, and it just means the one who helps or serves. So in the early church, you had the elders or you had the pastors. And by the way, please notice it's elders, pastors, shepherds, overseers. There should be a plurality of leadership. If you come to a church and you find a elder or a pastor or a set man, you know what you need to do? You need to run because you're either going to join a cult or a cult in the making. There is no such thing as a set man. There is always a plurality of leadership. And so what Paul is telling us is there are two-tiered leadership. You have the elders or the shepherds, and they're the overseer of your souls. They care for your souls. And then you have the deacons, and they were, you know, responsible for the physical needs of the body. Now, in the remaining time, though, that we have, I really want to zero in on the elders or the pastors or the bishops or the overseers, anything that you want to call them. You say, well, why do you want to do that? I'll tell you why. Because everything rises or falls on leadership. Everything rises or falls on leadership. And one of the big reasons that you're seeing a carnal, worldly church in America that lacks power is because you are seeing a leadership that is dysfunctional. And you're going to see why we are dysfunctional. You know, the apostle, or uh, not the apostle Paul, some people think Paul wrote Hebrews. I don't believe that. But in Hebrews chapter 13, we're introduced about spiritual leadership. It says this, Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. 
Then we're told this in verse 17, obey your spiritual leaders. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Obey your spiritual leaders. Do I hear an amen or an omi? And do what they, wow, gee, must have ripped that one out of the Bible. Their work is to watch over your souls. They are, now watch this, they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not sorrow. That would certainly be, not be for your benefit. You know, there was this uh, preacher and he uh, was a pastor for 20 years. And after 20 years, he quit the pastor, which is not unusual. I hate to say that, but it's not unusual for guys to burn out and to quit. Instead, though, he, he changed profession and he became a funeral director. Now, that is a little unusual. And someone asked him, why in the world did you change your profession? And the pastor said, I spent three years trying to straighten out John. And John is still an alcoholic. Then I spent six months trying to straighten out Susan's marriage, and she filed for divorce. Then I spent two and a half years trying to straighten out Bob's drug problem, and he's still an addict. Now at the funeral home, when I straighten them out, they stay straight. Guy's got a point. Let me tell you, being a pastor or an elder or a shepherd or an overseer is a very, very difficult job because it's very difficult to straighten people out. And in fact, it's most difficult if your own life isn't straightened out. You know, in the American church, it's not, though, generally uh, a, a difficult job to be an elder. And you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, see, we make an unbiblical distinction. I'm called the pastor, right? And then the other leaders are generally called lay elders. That's an unbiblical distinction. In the early church, we're just all pastors, okay? But let's go with the unbiblical distinction. I'll tell you that it's difficult. So we're the professional, I'm the professional, and then you have the lay elders, and they're, you know, usually not paid. And the reason why it's not a difficult job is because we usually don't demand that elders be biblical elders. And you're going to see this in a moment. You know what the average church, especially in suburbia, looks for for an elder? A businessman. Now, am I saying that businessmen are wrong? Am I saying that businessmen are evil? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying businessmen are busy doing business. And generally, businessmen are good at things. They're good at the making of a product, the managing of a product, and, and, and the selling of a product, a thing. When we're talking about a shepherd, when we're talking about an elder, when we're talking about a bishop, we're talking about someone who's in the people business. The job of a pastor or an elder or an overseer is the transformation of people. That's an entirely, entirely different thing. Now, the reason why, you say, well, why does the American church generally seek businessmen? I'll tell you why. Because the American church has become a business. In fact, it's become a big business. Do you realize that a lot of churches across America have taken millions and millions and millions of dollars? And I want you to know that the average pastor full-time guy, when he went to seminary, there was no course called 101 Business for Dummies. Didn't exist. So, you know, the average American church, what happens is that you have a once-a-month board meeting, you have the pastor meeting with these lay elders, and their function is twofold. The first thing that the average church board does the average elder board does, is they make the pastor and the staff accountable. And that's not a bad thing. You see, their job is to make sure that we're not misspending the money. You know, like having retreats to Hawaii in January. Or, 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 or spending it on nice cars and big homes and, you know, uh, j just having nice fancy lunches. I don't know any pastor that does that, do you? Um, I mean, that's their job. And, and that's a good thing that they're not misappropriating the money. The second thing, though, that the average elder board does when they meet once a month is to make sure that the church is running efficiently. You know what that means? It means they want to make sure that the church is growing. Growing financially. Growing in attendance. Growing uh, in, in terms of people, you know, making a decision for Christ. Growing in terms of, of baptism. 
So there's tremendous pressure on the pastor, the paid guy, and the staff to produce. This is true. And that's why you're seeing a dumbing down in the American church. Have you ever noticed, usually, you know, the messages now need to be really upbeat. They do. They need to be really positive. Why? So that you get excited, that you get jacked up. The music, we pay worship people now. You know, I thank God for, by the way, our worship teams. You know they do it for free? Did you know that? Very, very unusual. No. Usually in the American church, you would pay the person because it's so important that we, again, make you very excited. And I love it when the music's great. People go, oh, the spirit was awesome today. No, the guitar strings were just played well. That's all. But no, so, so there's a big show, and then you got the smoke machines going, then you got to have the great kids program, so you got to get a children's director, you got to pay them, but you got to have the youth director, and you're off and you have this huge budget. And you know what's sad? If you read the religious news almost weekly, monthly, you see these senior pastors burn out. They're on, no, seriously, they're, they're sexaholics. They're on alcohol, they're alcoholics, drugs, their marriages are terrible, their kids are going crazy, and they're forced to resign. And it's sad. No, it is truly sad. And I know a lot of these guys, and these guys aren't bad guys. They didn't start out that way. But see, they got involved in a dysfunctional church. They didn't know what to do because that's where their salary was coming from. They didn't have enough faith to stand against it and say, this is wrong. Now, let me tell you biblically what, you know, an elder or a shepherd or a pastor or a bishop, what our job description is. In fact, Peter tells us this in 1 Peter chapter 5. Skip, can you put it up? Here it is. Here's the job description of me and the elders. And now a word or two to who you are pastors in the church. I, too, that's Peter, am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I, too, will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you can get out of it. In other words, not for money, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people. No dictators here assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Peter says that an elder, pastor, bishop job description is twofold. First of all, he is to care for the flock. He is to care for the flock. You know what that means? It doesn't mean having a monthly meeting, sitting around a coffee table, having coffee, kicking your legs up and making some decisions about the running of the church. That's not what he's saying. He says that a true pastor... A true elder, a true bishop, a true overseer cares about you. That means he is actively involved in your life. Penetrating question now. How many people, no, this is a serious question. How many people can a pastor or an elder actively care for? Be actively involved in life. How many people? Oh, we're, we're getting almost Pentecostal. Wow, that's awesome. Let's take Jesus. You know, Jesus was a pretty talented guy, wasn't he? God in the flesh. How many guys, no, seriously, how many people did he invest his life in? How many people did he care about, actively involved in? Anyone want to take a guess? Between 1 and 12. 12. Jesus Christ spent seven tenths of his time on planet Earth the last three years in his ministry. No, no, you got to catch this now. This is God in the flesh. He spent seven tenths of his time pouring into 12 and he loses one. That's God. It's not easy to transform and make disciples. Now let's take little Frankie. That's me. How many people does little Frankie in charge of? Supposedly, according to the American mathematics, there's about 300. Do I have an S written on my chest? Trust me, not. You rip this off, C, coward. 
Not even close to Jesus. No, seriously, not even close. And we're not even a big church. No, no, we are not a big church. And do you seriously think that I can be actively involved? So people go, well, Frank's my pastor. There's no way, Jose. You're kidding yourself biblically. Not, not a chance. Not a chance. In fact, it, there are churches in the thousands. Do you actually think that pastor can care about you? Seriously, do you really think that? Not, not possible for the God. Do you know why the early church, let me tell you something. Do you know why the early church was so vibrant? Why they weren't worldly? Why the believers, I mean, they were powerful. Why were they so powerful? I'll tell you why. Because they were in house churches. 30, 40, 50. They're meeting in houses. Up tops, 30, 40, 50. And that includes men, women, and children. Do you see the difference? They had a pastor, an elder. And see, a pastor took each pastor took one house church. See, that makes sense. And then they would meet together and say, how's it going? How are you doing? Do you know what the function, do you know what it means to be a pastor and elder? We have a threefold job description, really, when it means to care. I'll tell you what. Number one, my job and the elder's job is to be able to take this book right here and explain it to you. That's job number one. N not telling you what I think. If you ever notice from the pulpit, I don't give you my opinion. It's my opinion's worthless. And pastors who do it shouldn't up here. All we need to do is to break this open for you so that you understand what this word says, right? So a pastor needs to understand this word and explain it to you. Number two, he should be interceding, praying for you. You know, if you read Paul's letters, he's constantly, wouldn't, isn't it nice to know that someone's interceding? Wouldn't you like to know that your shepherd is interceding for you? You deserve that. No, no, you deserve that. The third thing is he should be counseling you. He should be counseling you. In other words, is there anyone here who doesn't have a problem? Come and see me after. We have a class for delusional people. No, I'm just kidding. But no, we have problems. And a pastor's job is to take the truth and say, look, here's how we can solve this problem. Here's how you can be helped. Here's how you can be victorious. You deserve that. No, no, you deserve that. But see, we're not giving it to you because we're dysfunctional. Well, we got to move on. There is a second, second function of the pastor. Listen to this now. Peter says in chapter 5 and verse 3 that the pastor, the elder, the bishop, the overseer is to lead you. To lead you. Do you know how we're to lead, though? Do you see what it says? By example. By example. Do you know what an example is? An example is a live role model. A live role model. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, hey guys, come, come and hear me speak. He didn't say that. He said, come follow me. Come watch me. Come, I'll show you how to do this thing called Christianity. Now, by the way, we can either be a positive role model or a negative role model. Let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. Mickey Mantle. I don't know, Skip, do you have a picture of Mickey Mantle? Well, Mickey Mantle needs no introduction if you are a baseball fan or if you're a Yankee fan. Mickey Mantle, no doubt, is one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game. What a lot of people don't know is that Mickey Mantle died at age 63 of cirrhosis of the liver. Four weeks before he died, he gave his final press conference. He was emaciated. There you're looking at him. He had lost 40 pounds. He was skeletal. And four weeks before he died, he was standing before hundreds of reporters and fans. And here were his final words to the public. I owe so much to my family and to God, he said. You see, Mickey Mantle, in the last months of his life, surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. I want you to know that. There's every reason to believe that today Mickey Mantle is in heaven because he did surrender his life to Jesus Christ. But listen to what he said. Then he said this, Mantle went on, I want to thank 
the American people for accepting me as they have, for being such great fans. And then Mantle began choking up. God gave me the ability to play baseball. God gave me everything. But kids out there, don't be like me. All you have to do is look at me to see I wasted my life. I sadly was no role model. I want to get across to kids not to drink, not to do drugs. Mom and dad, you, you should be the role models, not baseball players. Hear, hear from Mickey Mantle. And Mantle ended his talk by saying this, I just want to start giving back. All my life, all I've done up to this point is take. That's sad. That is sad. But redemption came for Mantle because he did at the end of his life give great tribute to Jesus Christ by believing in him and surrendering him. And I want you to know out here, you only got one life. I only have one. No, I'm telling you, you have one life to live. What kind of example are you? You know what? The people around you will tell you. No, no. The people around you will tell you. What kind of example are you? Just look at the people that you are producing around you. You might find this interesting. Max Jukes, Skip put up his picture. Most of you don't know Max Jukes. Max Jukes was an atheist. He lived an ungodly life. He married an ungodly woman. They had 540 descendants. 310 died paupers. 150 were criminals. Seven were murderers, 100 were drunkards, and more than half the women ended up prostitutes. Jonathan Edwards. Skip, can you put up his picture? Jonathan Edwards. Many of you would know him. He was a famous preacher back in the 1700s. He was part of the Great Awakening. John, Jonathan Edwards was a godly man. He married a godly woman. They had 1,394 descendants. Now listen to this. 13 were college presidents. 65 were college professors. Three were U.S. senators. 30 were judges. 100 were lawyers. 60 were doctors. 75 were Navy and Army officers. 100 were preachers and missionaries. 60s were authors of prominence. One was the vice president of the United States. Eight were public officials, and 295 were college graduates who became state governors and U.S. ambassadors. Do you think your example matters? I'm going to tell you the most powerful thing you have in your tool chest, the most influential thing you have in your tool chest is your example. Pastors, elders, overseers, bishops, we are to be an example, a living example of what it means to live like Jesus Christ. That is a tall order. Anybody want to sign up here and be an elder, by the way? We're, we're taking names. Now let me give you the challenge. The challenge is very simple. What should you be looking for in a pastor? What should you be looking for in an elder? What should you be looking for in a bishop or an overseer? Titus chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. The Apostle Paul writes this, starting in verse 5. I, that's Paul, left you, that's Titus, on the island of Crete, so that you could complete our work there and appoint an elder. Oh, excuse me. Elders, pastors, bishops, overseers, same word. In each town I instruct you. Now watch this. An elder must live a blameless life. That does not mean, by the way, a perfect life. It means that he is above reproach. It means that there's actually no accusation against him. It also says he must be faithful to his wife, a one-woman man. What this means, by the way, is in ancient times, especially in the island of Crete, they had polygamy. So what he's really saying is that an elder cannot have a small harem. That's what he's saying. So any guy that has multiple wives, he's out. Then he says this. He goes, and his children, now watch this, must be believers. Bad translation. Really, it should say his, his children must be faithful. 
or honorable, who don't have a reputation of being wild or rebellious. An elder is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. Woo! This is going to cancel out a lot of people. Now, an elder, I see, I, I couldn't make my three daughters be believers. It wasn't in my power. But let me tell you something. They better respect me. They better be obedient to me. A lot of guys are in trouble here, but we just, we just run past it. You got a lot of guys standing up here, and their houses are out of order. No, their houses are out of order. See, we, we just skim by everything. That's, they, they cannot be a leader in the church, biblically speaking. He must not be arrogant. It must mean he can't be proud. He can't think that he's above everyone, better than everyone. Or quick-tempered. I think that's obvious what it means. He must not be a heavy drinker, a wine-bibber, meaning he likes to, to drink. Also, it says that uh, he must not be violent, solving problems with his fists, or dishonest with money. That's a bad translation. You know what it means? It literally says in the Greek, greedy. Greedy for money. Asking you for money. You know anybody like that? Any preachers like that? No, no, that's what it's saying. It's, it's really sad we're not following this. We, we got people in leadership in the church in America that are money grubbers. Verse 8, rather he must enjoy having guests in his home. In other words, an elder, a pastor, a bishop should be inviting you to into their home. Why? That was a question. Pentecost, come on. To be an example so you see how it's done. See, I invite you in so that you can say, wow, Frank's not wasting money. You don't see a Cadillac or a Mercedes in front of the, you know, the apartment. No, no, there's a reason why I do what I do. I have to show you how to do it, and every elder should be doing the same way. Watch this, and he must love what is good. That means that a true leader in the church is not interested in the gossip rags. All right? Has no interest in that kind of garbage. It also says that he must live wisely, and he must be fair. In other words, the guy must, you know, make smart decisions, good decisions. Do you see? Does your elders, does your pastor make good decisions, or is he stupid? Just write stupid, you know? Then it says this, he must live a devout and a disciplined or self-controlled life. That means when you're looking for an elder or a pastor, is their life really about Jesus? No, really, is their life really about Jesus in advancing his kingdom? That's what you're looking for. That's what it's saying right here. And then finally, Verse 9, it says, he must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. So a pastor, an elder, a bishop, an overseer, a shepherd must know this backwards and forward, must be able to rightly divide it so they can help you to live, know truth, live in truth, walk in truth, and walk in in freedom. Now, as, as you look at that list, quickly, because we got to end here, as you, as you just look at that list, what, what jumps out at you? Oh, that was a question. There, there's nothing there that requires a person to be really talented. Did you see that? It's all character. No, no, it's all character. There's only one technical thing the guy has to know the Word of God and be able to explain. Other than that, it's all character. God said, my leaders, my men must be men of character. Now, how shameful and what's happened here even in America. Political science major, I found something very interesting in the mid-1990s occurred in America. For the first time, we no longer cared about character. Bill Clinton, Skip, can you put up his picture? He was in the White House. Do you know he may have the highest IQ of any president, any president that we've had? This guy's a talented guy. This guy's a smart guy. And by the way, he had the economy going on all eight cylinders the last four years of his life. The only pro four years of his presidency, the only problem was he had a lying problem. He had a lust problem. He had a philandering problem. And he scored high in the sociopathic tale. Other than that, he was a great guy. And he was impeached. Now, here's what was, here's what was fascinating. Do you know they took a poll of the American people when he was impeached? 
and they asked him, do you want Bill Clinton to remain in the White House? Does character matter? Do you know for the first time, over 50% of the American people said, we don't care. I don't care what that man does behind closed doors. I don't care what his private life is. I just care that he's producing and the economy's running on all eight cylinders. No, no, that's absolutely true. For the first, this country was already turning. For the first time, we said character does not matter. And let me tell you something that's invaded every area of America. We don't care about our sports figures. We don't, as long as they can get a touchdown, woohoo, woo, baby, we don't care. Beat your wife up, we don't care. Get him back out on the field, man. We gotta win. We gotta win, and we gotta win big. No, it's invaded every area, sports, celebrities, political realm, business realm. You wonder why we're imploding. Character absolutely matters. God said character is foremost important in leadership, and that's what you need to be looking for. I will tell you this. If the foundation is cracked, if your leadership is cracked, the superstructure will surely fall down. I'm telling you, America will fall. The American church is falling. Because we like character. We lack character. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. You know, every single person sitting here is a leader in some form. Did you know that? We all lead at times. We all lead at times. What is our example? No. What is our example? Because you see, if you have lousy character, people don't do what you say, they do, do what they see you doing. And if you have bad character, they will have bad character. Trust me. And your house will be a mess. Your sports team will ultimately be a mess. Your business will be a mess. Oh, there's a lot riding here. What kind of example are you? Lord. I pray we'll take this really seriously. See, we're impressed in America with what someone can produce. You could care less. You're impressed with the Jobs of this world. Look at my man Job. He's a righteous man. That's what you note. And there's not a person in this room that can't hear well done, good and faithful servant by being a person of tremendous character reflecting Jesus Christ wherever they go, whether it be their home, their neighborhood, or their place of work, and impact people positively. Oh, I pray that we will become more and more a church, a people of character. And I ask for this in your precious name.